Okay, I may have added a little bit too much baby brine shrimp here. But anyways, hello, hello everyone, it's your boy Ryan back with a new breeding project, and the star of today is the famous Neon Tetra. So I'll be taking you through the entire process, and uh, let's get started and jump right in. I initially had some issues with the store-bought Neons. They were sick and starving, but after a month of intensive rehabilitation, I'm happy to say these guys are looking incredible. The biggest challenge facing me now is this. The Neon Tetras require very specific water parameters to breed, and so it's a good idea to prepare the water first before I even start conditioning the Tetras, as the process of aging the water can take three to four weeks. The good thing though is that I have a pretty good idea of what kind of water they like. Oh, I know what the ladies like. Alright, so I made a quick trip to Lowe's because Neon Tetras really prefer soft, acidic water to breed in. And I'm looking for peat moss because that will drop my pH down to 4 or 5 and also add a lot of tannins in the water, which is not only a great antifungal, but also will stain the water brown and make the Neon Tetras super, super comfortable and allow them to breed because the more comfortable your fish are, the easier it is to breed them. This is an impressive array of plants that I want to buy, but I have a full $20 left in my account and I need to conserve my financials. So I found some sphagnum peat moss, but the miracle Grow brand, if you look carefully, it says enriched with miracle Grow plant food, which means they added fertilizer. Now, if I was growing a tomato, this would be perfect, but since I'm breeding fish, the fertilizer can raise our GH as well as potentially poison our fish. So I really want to look for pure 100% sphagnum peat moss, and the same story goes with the potting mix. So let's go in the back and see if we can find another product. Okay, so this is pure sphagnum peat moss, no additives whatsoever. For our project, you really only need a few handfuls of peat moss, so this is way overkill. Now the rest will go into my garden, but if you don't have a garden, you don't want to have a huge bag of peat moss sitting around as leftover, I've gone ahead and put a link in the description below to something a little bit more manageable in size. So we are back from Lowe's, and what I've done is already opened up this peat moss package, and made these little mango sized uh, tea bags of peat moss. The outside, I actually just use like a sock or a pantyhose and that'll allow the water in and keep the peat moss inside. I made two of them for our purposes and if you look at the peat moss, it is actually, let me get my hat out of the way, but look at the peat moss, it is actually super, super powdery, super soft and it feels really nice. I could just keep my hand in there and just let it rest. But on the other side, the important thing is the distilled water. I got this off of um, Walmart's racks and it was about 80 cents a gallon. You need maybe five to 10 gallons depending on how much, uh, how large your breeding tank is. And you also have to think about doing water changes, right? So anyways, this distilled water is the same as like RO water, rainwater, you know, if you want to collect rainwater, you can do that. I just feel like it's, um, it takes a long time, if you will. So what we're going to do is we are going to put this into a five gallon jug along with all of the water that we got from Walmart. And then we're going to let that soak for about three to four weeks. It's going to go through the entire basically cycling stage, right? There's going to be a bacterial bloom because you're adding nutrients into the, the water, but you're gonna let that settle down, it's gonna clear up for us, and then it's gonna be perfect time to breed the neons. So while we are letting the water sort of um, develop and cure or age, if you will, we are going to now talk about the neon tetras themselves. So I'll see you back inside.
my conditioning regimen is simple. It's just live baby brine shrimp freshly hatched as often as I can manage, and that usually works out to be once a day. I don't think there's any other live food that's as effective, as cheap, and as simple as hatching out live baby brine shrimp. It's widely loved by all of the fish I've ever bred, but it also isn't the only food. In the morning, right before I leave work, I'll feed them some pellets or flake food, really fast foods that form the basis of their nutrition. And then when I come home, I'll feed live baby brine shrimp because I'll have a little bit more time. That way, not only do they have the basal nutrition from the flakes, they also have this added protein and fat that are going to be really useful for them to make more eggs. Now, when it comes to conditioning, the trick is to actually have adults that are able to be conditioned. Because if you have juvenile fish, feeding as much baby brine shrimp and as much flakes as possible will just not work. They're not ready to breed yet. So always make sure that your fish are old enough to start breeding. And for neon tetras, this is usually going to be around one to two months after you bring them home from the store. The fish that the camera is following around is a male that's ready to spawn. It's well conditioned, it's got a beautiful streamlined shape, and it's super energetic zipping around. The next time that you do a water change, sit around the tank and see which fish are chasing the fat females around the tank. And that's usually a sign that tells you that the males are ready to spawn. Females, on the other hand, will have much wider rib cages and abdomens. So sometimes I'll feed baby brine shrimp, wait about 10 to 15 minutes, and then come back just to see which of the fish have much wider bellies than the other. And then those usually are the ones that I'll choose for breeding stock. So at that point, I'm able to separate out the males and the females relatively easily and move on with the next step of the project. As a teaching point, this fish I'm following is much harder to tell whether or not it's a male or a female. It's got characteristics of both. It's a thin, streamlined shape, but also has a pretty wide belly if you look at it from the top after eating. My guess is that it's a male, but in the absence of actually testing it out with a proven male or a female, I would probably not spawn this particular fish. It's most likely just a juvenile that's not ready to spawn yet. But in this case, it goes to show that even though I'm conditioning an entire school of fish and I'm raising them up at the same time, not every fish in the school will be ready to breed at the same time. So you should really take some time to sit around the tank and observe which ones are your males and which ones are your females that are ready to be spawned. One last thing to prepare before we set up our breeding container is the Infusoria culture. I have a really great video on how to get a dense, safe, effective culture of paramecium in the upper right corner for feeding, but neon tetras need to eat on day four or five after they are born. So if you aren't able to feed Infusoria, all of your fry will die regardless of whether or not you get a successful spawn because they're too small to eat baby brine shrimp. And by the time your fish are born, it's too late to start a culture. So most fish, and neon tetras included, have this horrifying tendency of eating their own eggs. And I needed to make a container that would separate the eggs and the adults once they're done spawning. In front of you, it's just a Tupperware container. This is my original concept of a Tupperware container attached to a plastic mesh and using a hinge where it's basically just holes drilled into the Tupperware and tied with fishing line. So it provides a nice stable hinge for us to open and close this container with. On the other side, I also put in some holes and originally I wanted to tie that together with more fishing line, but it ended up being a really big pain in the butt to open and close. I wanted it to have really quick, easy access so I could go up, pull it out, pull the eggs, check for eggs, and then push it back in. My solution was to use this paper clip. By putting the paper clip into this hole and through the mesh, and then sort of moving it up and turning it, I was able to create tension on the paper clip, which held this mesh and the Tupperware together. It's a little bit hard to explain. You really have to make it, but check out the configuration of this paper clip. It is 
very, very sort of, it's bent out, but it's also not fully unraveled. And it was this tension that allowed me to keep this uh, mesh onto the Tupperware just like this without any issues. Once I tested it out though, I realized that it floated. Who knew plastic would float? right but my solution was to use these lead weights these are fishing weights they're called egg sinkers and i put in two of them on each side of the tupperware and if you don't have this that's fine just use a rock but make sure that it's not a rock that would increase your hardness and leach minerals into your water for example serious stone a really popular aquascaping rock can increase your hardness so use something inert like a, a, a dragon stone but once I fasten the paper clip, I needed also some java moss or spawning medium so that the fish will go in, lay their eggs in the java moss, and then the eggs would then sink down through the mesh and go into the safety of this Tupperware. So this was my first experiment using a group spawning technique. This worked really well with the cardinals. In fact, they only spawned if there were multiple fish and multiple pairs of cardinals inside the tanks. So I figured why not try this with the neons? But keep this in mind, like if there's a first experiment, there's probably a second experiment later in this video. And in fact, there is. Um, but keep that in mind at the back of your mind as I talk about what ended up actually happening. So the spawning tank is really just this uh, shoebox sized plastic tub filled with the water we had spent super long conditioning with the peat moss as well as this egg laying contraption and I also put in five neon tetras in there. Two males, three females, all of which were really, really well conditioned. Now, neon tetras spawn during first light or at dawn, so I would put them in around 3 o'clock in the afternoon the day before, have them spend the entire time acclimating, and then through the night, and then in the morning, they would start spawning. That was the goal, that was the plan, but um, one of the things was, as I opened up the egg catching contraption, I was like, really really excited looking for eggs i had no i kind of know what they look like from the cardinals and neons they they look very similar to eggs but i was looking around and well i saw nothing there was nothing there literally no eggs whatsoever i was really disappointed because i thought i had done everything right the water was right uh the egg laying contraption was right it worked for other fish um but I think what ended up happening was because we had multiple males and multiple females in there, right? The if you if you're thinking in the sort of point of view of one particular male, for example, your your attention would be split among three different females, which means that you don't actually spend that much time chasing each specific female. And the same thing goes for each of the three females, right? You're not really going to spend that much quality time with the other male that you, that are that wants to breed with you. So in the end, I decided that we're going to try a pairwise spawning. So that way, one male is paired with one female. They would spend the entire time, like in this video, with each other. And so this would actually be my second try or my second experiment. And I put them, I removed all the other extra males and females. I left them in basically the same thing. And then that was it for the day. And then the next morning, this is what happened. All right, so guys, it's like super early in the morning, basically dawn. Uh, if I turn off this light here, you guys can't see me because looking outside, there's basically no sun whatsoever. Um, but, oh my God, that's bright. But um, this is what we need to do to wake up early to check up on our neon tetras. So we're gonna go downstairs and see if we can find anything. Okay, I'll be honest, I ended up going back to uh, sleep for another hour and a half because I figured if they're breeding at dawn, why would I check at dawn? I would probably wait a couple hours before I check. So here we are once again. And um, the best way to look for eggs I've found has been to use a flashlight and to just light up the back because then the eggs will sort of reflect the light and it'll be much easier to see because the eggs are pretty much uh, see-through and transparent if you can't shine a light uh, behind them or across them. 
Now ignore the copepods and just kind of zoom it around. That's not what we're looking for. But we're looking for the eggs, right? And what do you see? You guys, can you actually see those eggs? Because I was so excited when this happened. And, you know, I was like, I could barely hold that, hold this like container because I was just like shaking in excitement. Also, I'm kind of weak, I'm kind of a wimp. But, but anyways, um, the next thing to do now is basically to just you know, count a little bit about how many eggs I have and then put them under the microscope because that's what I like to do with all of my breeding projects, right? If you've been here for the Cardinals or the Amato Shrimp Breeding Project, you know that I love putting them under the microscope. So here we are. So on the left is the eggs um, after I put them in the microscope. And this is on day one. On the right is a day two fry, which is the one that you saw just earlier, right? This is the second spawn. I actually managed to get them spawned twice in a row, two days. But these ones are just absolutely fascinating. 40 times magnification in under the microscope. You can see, basically, they're not very well developed when they come out of the eggs, right? It only takes one day for them to, to hatch out. And they're basically just a tail, a head, and a bunch of yolk in the middle. So they really do the rest of their developing. Um, their eggs, their, their eyes are completely clear, by the way. Also, that's a little bit of a paramecia, which is kind of swimming around. But the eyes are completely clear. They can't really see anything. I, I realize that they, they, they sort of respond to like movement of the water, um, maybe light. Um, but I'm not really sure right now because their eyes aren't fully developed yet They do this over the past of the next like three to four days and then they become free swimming on day five. So for me I want to make sure that I keep them in a very very clean Environment you can see the blood moving through this this fish which is I think is absolutely fascinating like oh my god nature is so metal look at that but I'll keep these guys in a small container in the very first couple of days, like up to like a week, week and a half, because I want to make sure that they have plenty of access to food. I can feed them really well, like in this little small container. And I'll do a water change every day just to make sure that you know, none of the parameters get too bad. Because when I put in infusoria, that infusoria culture contains ammonia and other sorts of like uh, uh, metabolic wastes, especially from the paramecium and the bacterial bloom that, that happens beforehand, right? But this is about a week into the uh, breeding project after the, the fish were laid eggs, and you can see that there are some free swimming fry already. These guys are eating all the paramecium that the light is shining on right now. If you take a look at that darker part of the um, of the bowl, you could see all those white specks swimming through the water. That's paramecium. And oh, look, there's a little bit of a neon tetra uh, swimming up towards the top of the video here. At this stage, the eyes are now dark and fully developed. So I think I'm going to end it here for my neon tetra breeding project. Thank you guys so much for watching until the end. If you liked what you saw here today, be sure to like and subscribe if you want to get this video up as high as we can in the YouTube algorithm and be sure to stay tuned for more in the future. Thank you so much, Avatar Aquatics out.